Let's yes. Do hey guys, it's Lavetta. And it's Miriam. And this is Notorious Women Podcast, a comedy podcast about some of history's most notorious women. Yes, yes. Yes, it is. So okay. I know you just came back from New York and you had a wonderful they did. time. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was Good. weird. What do you mean? Because I was by myself. And I'm never by myself. Yeah. And so it was like, it was glorious. Like, (laughs) but it was also a little bit disconcerting because I realized that in my life, I bounce my world off of all these things and I had nothing to bounce off. That's the life of a woman. Right. But I also got to see like really good friends I haven't seen in four years. Like, because of COVID. So, yeah. and I took dance classes. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. Did you get pizza? Did you? Listen, I got Joe's Pizza, West mm-hmm. 4th Street. That's mm-hmm. the one. I got a bagel. It wasn't like my perfect ideal bagel situation. And yet it was still so good. So good. And oh also, God. little known thing to do in New York City is go to Astoria and eat Greek food. And if you're oh. if you're about to do that, like DM me, okay? I'll tell you what to order because I literally sat down with friends who don't actually do that. They live in a story, but they don't actually go much to Greek. So I was like, okay, guys, like here's what we're gonna order. It is squid, it is Greek salad, and it is taramasalata. I can repeat that later. So <laughs> delicious. I I mm. that sounds mm. delicious. Mm. I love squid. Mm. I love oh my squid. god. Lavetta, no, not everybody does, I but I love it. You yeah. need to go to New York City together. Oh. Okay. And we will go to there. I know exactly where we're going to go to. I have New York has the best food. It's so good. I mean, because it's a melting pot. It truly is. Like, yeah. I used to didn't like Chinese food until I lived in New York City. And yep. I was like, oh, Same. this is what people are talking about. Oh, okay. Like, oh, okay. this, this is delicious. Yeah. Exactly. This is yeah. delicious. So, mm-hmm. well, I think we should get started. Uh, I, because I know we're a bit on a, uh, we're, we are a bit uh, on a schedule today, you and I. It's because we're very Both. busy and very important. Okay. Yeah, that part. <laughs> yeah. Not. Not um, exactly. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think I'm first this week. Okay. So mine's a short one this week. Um, and it's fascinating because, I, you know, we are in the midst of all of this political scandals and oh yeah all of this stuff and like you just never know i'm always like fascinated and this is why we got into entertainment because we're fascinated about stories but also yes. people and characters yes. right yes. so my notorious woman this week is mary jane skaden tweed or mary jane tweed what an amazing name <laughs> yeah yeah I don't, yeah. I don't know her, but I love her name. Oh, good. Well, let okay. me tell you a little bit about <laughs> Mary Jane. So, tell me, tell me, tell me. Mary Jane. Now, the name Tweed will probably sound somewhat familiar to our listeners and to you as well. So, uh, shortly it will become clear. Oh, oh I know who she is. I know, know who, who she is? is. Well, Tweed, go on. Yes. Okay. I think I All read right, a book good. once. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> once, just once. <laughs> Mary Jane Tweed was born Mary Jane C. Skaden in New York City on March 14th, 1825. Oh, yeah. Boss Tweed. I'm sorry. I get that (laughs) (laughs) way. Listen, when my brain works, I get really excited. Okay. (laughs) I know. I mean, popular culture, it it works. Mm -hmm. But so she was born March 14th, 1825 to Joseph C. Skaden and Jane C. Saxbury. Okay. Now she, it seems like Mary Jane, there's not a lot on her. So let me preface that uh, by saying, oh, also for yeah. this, uh, for today's story, a lot of my stuff came from, um, there's a book called Boss Tweed, semicolon, the story of, of Grim Generation by Dennis Tilden Lynch. Okay. Also a biography, a biography.com article. Um, the website, thefamouspeople.com and politicalgraveyard.com. So, oh, you found all the things. Yeah, actually, no, because uh, the no. sad thing about this is that there isn't a lot known about her. Oh, so, yeah. Because it's, of him. Yeah. The little known fact about what we do quite often 
it, it's just as hard when there's so much information as when there's yeah. no information. Uh, yeah. And yeah. No information. You have to look farther. It's true. Yeah. And this is pre Gilded Age. So this when she was born, at least. OK. So um, so this is a while back. So it could be that. But also because it seems like uh, Joseph, her father, was a pretty well off man. He actually owned a brush making factory. Oh. So they were they had some coins like they had some stacks, right. you know, right. so Ooh, good, so much so day. that she met in 1843. She actually met a man by the name of William Neger Tweed, uh, who worked as a brush maker and then a bookkeeper oh. for her father at the factory. Okay. Okay. Now, the two must have hit it off. Who knows? Who, who's to say that, you know, they're two young people thrust together or William saw an opportunity to marry up. Who knows? You know what? Sometimes two birds, one stone. You exactly. know, she cute, exactly. she rich. Let's do this. You know, yes, it's like the Martha Washington and George Washington. Like, right. I have no doubt that it was a love match, but sure. Martha looked real good because she had all that money. So uh, she was like, not mad. You know, not mad. So, um, so whatever the two courted and they eventually married. Now, I found three different uh, day dates, really? uh, but they did get married in 1854. So they got married okay. a year later, either on September oh. 18th, the 21st or the 29th. <laughs> so who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But the two lived with her. Um, so Mary then lived with her new husband, William, with her family in their home on Madison oh. Street for about two years. Ooh. Okay. So I mean, I, also, I assume a large home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it seems like, you know, everything was bigger back then and the father yeah. had some money. So, but that's also an indication that William did not have a lot of money because yeah. he was not able. And it could be that, you know, her dad's like, you're not taking my girl out. Like, you know. Yeah. Like okay. she's She's used to living a certain way. So, um, and then there are some reports that William... Uh, became uh, her father's partner in some way. So, but that's just a little hazy. The earlier part of, okay. of this story is a little hazy. And I think it's just because of what came, comes later. So now, you know, obviously William, her husband is a go-getter. So she's this woman, I'm assuming he married above his, his, his station. So he married okay, yes. above yeah, him. Yeah, that, that seems right. And she married sort of beneath her, right? Yeah. So... Um, but in 1848, so uh, four years after they were married, William organized a volunteer fire company uh, okay. called Fire Engine Engine Company Number Six, aka uh, the Americas Engine Company. Okay, which some say was a little more than an organized gang. Now, yeah, probably <laughs> for context. Yeah, the, what we think of like the the modern. Um, fire department now it was not what it was back then back then fire was a, a huge concern a huge hazard because a lot of the stuff was uh, made of wood a lot yeah, of the buildings ev everything was basically made of wood because it was cheaper wood and manure that oh, is what oh, everything oh, was that's yeah. disgusting think okay. about it that's why um, the rich lived in brick buildings yeah yeah so now at this time, so a lot of the fire, uh, like putting out business, was created by volunteer fire companies. So it's not like they trained yeah. these; they literally volunteered. And I, if I were an enterprising and a, a criminal, uh, I yeah. would use it as sort of like a modern day sort of um, how would you say? Like uh, you come in, and be like, it's shame if something happened to this building. Uh, <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. That's what happened. Mm, probably did. Yeah. So because the way they described a lot of these fire companies and they would like regularly fight each other. Oh. So they're a bunch of thugs. Like, okay. Yeah. That sounds like, like a movie I would watch for sure. Yeah. A lot of but, white on white crime. In yes. This, a lot of white know, on white crime. It is a big problem. We need to do something about it. Okay. Yeah. So in 1848, he started. You know those white uh, people, though. I mean, you can't really control them. So. I mean, that's why when people say that, it's always. It, I will say it's, sometimes it's usually like uh, 
immigrants or like first generation. I'm like, have you met white people? Uh, I know, right? Uh, white on white crime is really big let's, throughout history. Let's just, just go back to the thing we keep going back to because it's a fact. Hundred years war. Okay. Yeah. All the all white. All yeah. day. Okay. All day. So they would. Uh, and so what we know about uh, William later on, it seemed that he fit right in into this crowd. Yeah, I believe it. He didn't have a lot of education, but he did have a lot of uh, drive. So okay. and that could have been something that attracted her to him. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the story is about him because we don't know that much about her. But I want to ask your question. I, I want to ask the audience and you some things okay. when we get into this a little bit. So um, he because by all accounts, he. He's very competitive in nature and a bit had a bit of a violent streak, which I think is probably common for a lot of men back then. Because, again, yeah. a lot of dirt, manure and wood stuff everywhere. So there was also like we listen, we're kind of entering another phase of that in our country. But like there was no regulation. You lost your nope. job. You just starved to death. Like That's it. There, there, you really had to fight for there was nothing, you know, yeah. and there's, you know. Yeah. So it's gonna so, make it's gonna make people crazy. Yeah. So I do have some grace for some of these people. Uh, also, slavery still going on. So there's that too. Oh, yeah. there we uh, go. Not in New York City, but still in the country. Now still in the country and in the zeitgeist of the time. So yeah, and in the zeitgeist. Uh, and the North was still profiting from uh, slave oh. labor in the yes. South. So um, yes. now. Because he was known for, you know, word got around about his reputation. This is attracted the attention of the democratic political machine in New York city. Now yes. for context, the Democrats okay. were what we would consider Republicans or right wingers today. Mm -hmm. yeah. so let's be clear about that. Okay. So now when he was about 26 in 1850, he actually ran for assistant city alderman, but he lost. Um, now on his second trial a year later, he ran again and won and actually served as the alderman for the seventh ward for one term in 1852 in Congress, which oh. by all accounts was unremarkable. So okay. it seemed like that kind of uh, way to come up in the world didn't appeal to him. I have a spec that I have a, a I suspect that William did not really want to serve the public. <laughs> uh, he wanted the power Yes, without the, the responsibility, perhaps. Yeah, that wasn't really in his nature. So yeah. now in 1856, he was elected to uh, a new city board of supervisors. Uh, yeah. And so it's so interesting because you think politically he took a step down, but actually this new position gave him a lot more power in the city. Yeah, in 1856, New York City. Mm. So. The first position, this is where it's reported that he started to engage in some corrupt practices, you know. Now, okay. while William is coming up in the world and figuring out a way to make some money, uh, Mary Jane, meanwhile, was having a lot of children. I mean, a lot. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And beginning in 1845, um, she had and, and, and until 1865. So for a 20 year period. What? To okay. the end of the Civil War. Oh she had God. 10 children. Okay. My vagina hurts. Okay. 10 children. My ovaries are running away. They're running away. In the, or in the 1840s. In the 1840s. 1850s, and she, 1860s. She, no. No. How? How? She had a lot of kids. Uh, that, they don't have antibiotics yet. Girl, I don't. Mary Jane should be given a medal. Just. Yeah. For Just, yeah, now some reports say that they may have had uh twelve, but two died. So, yeah. uh, again, ten children Damn. over Damn. a twenty-year period. I, mm, this is why she's notorious. You can stop right there. So she was born in eighteen twenty-five. <laughs> so when okay. she was twenty in eighteen forty-five, she began she began having children until she was forty. Oh my god! In eighteen sixty-five. Oh, um, I would never let him touch me after after baby baby seven, baby seven. I'd well, be like, I'm I died, and now I'm gone. So I mean, I wonder. I just I'm so fascinated by uh, like marriages like this. So now yeah. again, she started having children in eighteen forty-five, but by the mid eighteen fifties, they they've been they've started living on the high life. So. Uh, William's career has taken off. He's a rising star in New York City politics. 
And in the 1850s, he, he also became a key player in Tammany Hall. Yes. Basically, the behind the scenes group that had the make or break power over local uh, Democratic Party nominations in New York City. Yeah. So he didn't create Tammany Hall, which I always thought he just became the face of it. OK, I, it was already I really set up. Thought it was like him. Okay. No, he said it was already it was already set up, but he uh, when he joined, he took it to a whole nother level. Okay. <laughs> so just so you, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into a lot of this, but just so people understand the context of it. So it's the 1850s in New York City. So you know how we think about city contracts and getting stuff built. The city's boom, yeah. immigrants are coming in. Uh, there's a huge boom, uh, building boom. Uh, you know, this is before the income tax. <laughs> yeah. So people are making lots and lots of money. Okay. So the building boom is huge. So what he would do, he would use his power in local uh, politics and on this board to grant favors to builders, basically, aka uh, bribes. Yes. He also did something that was actually really ingenious because he was on this board. He understood where, uh, let's say, when the new railroad was going to be made or the new water line was going to be made. He understood where strategic real estate holdings would be in the city. So he started purchasing them for himself. And okay. His cronies. Well, yeah. So, and he was able why, to stay Why in don't power. I hang out with people like this? I don't hang out with people like this. Well, because you have a little bit of conscience. And this is why we have <sighs> to always have, right. keep an eye out for corruption. Yeah. Uh, because uh, people like this are just, uh, <laughs> I watched one documentary on YouTube uh, and the guy was saying that, he was like, uh, William was the kind of guy, he couldn't just have one mistress. He had to have two. <laughs> he couldn't have like yeah. four houses. He had to have 12. Like yeah. he was just that kind of guy. Yeah. Um, so he couldn't have just power uh, in one area. He had to control everything. He couldn't steal just a uh, hundred dollars. He has to steal a million dollars. Like he's Listen, that kind I call of guy. It, I call it like a small penis syndrome situation. You know, like I don't know what his body looked like, but like, I just feel like, you know, when the ego is constantly desperate, there's something else going on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I also, I mean, again, to give some of these people grace, like he came from a very like uh, poor background and he didn't have like formal education. Unlike Mary, Mary seems to have come again from, a pretty well-established family. She had, you know, the education that a woman of her station would be able to have, which wasn't much, you know, remember the Martha I mean, Washington eighth grade. So, um, <laughs> yeah. but at least she could read. And also it's just, it's right. all about like uh, status, right? So much so, even though Americans love to be like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which we actually do love. We kind of turn our noses up at people who come from money because we're like, well, yeah, that's easy. Like, I mean, we're very so, specific in where we give credit. It's like, yeah. you definitely have to have had the boots on, right? Yeah, you have feet, to have boots. And someone had to buy you those boots, right? And that's but also a false... Maybe you have to, like, purchase the laces. Well, it's also okay. a false narrative, which I think oh, people yeah. like, which William also attests to, because it's not about... I feel like he went into politics that first thing with Alderman. He was like, okay, I'm making more money, but this sucks. This is not right. They told me I'm, I'm supposed to have like the whole kitten caboodle, right? So I want more. So I maybe want I have more. To, I, maybe I have to like uh, shave a little bit off the top, you know? Listen, I could write this musical. Okay. Um. On. So he, so that's basically how this, uh, this sort of machine worked. So he used, he and his cronies, so he would hire his friends and put them in key positions throughout the city, like okay. at the water department or like da 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 And so yeah. that way they, they, you have to pay up no matter where you are. This is actually very common in a lot of places in the world now and still in New York City. Mm -hmm. It's quite as some parts. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, that's kind of like how it works. So basically they would use government contracts uh, to lie in their own pockets, which is the money coming from the people. Right. Okay. Uh, to lie in their pockets. Now, they were able to stay in control because on top of doing this, they were good to the poor. They like, you know, particularly the Irish immigrant population oh. and the Irish American population. Yeah. They particularly, a lot of them couldn't read. And that doesn't mean that people weren't uneducated, but they just, they're like, well, what, what, what have you done for me lately? So 
uh, Tweed and his buddies would like give money to the poor. They would actually physically go out and give things to the poor. They would get wow, Irish okay. immigrants a lot of jobs on these things. But, but it's so funny because they were giving them one thing on one hand, but also robbing the city city and therefore them blind on the other hand. Right. Yeah. So it's like yeah. I'm giving you um I'm giving, I'm getting you a job making $10 an hour. You pay into the union at $4 uh-huh. right, an hour. The person's happy because they're like, hey, I still got six and they're giving out turkeys during, you know, right. Christmas and da da da. And they're, but they're also robbing the $4, collect a $4. Right. They're I robbing mean, that. It's optics. It's all yes. optics. It's like, yes. look what a gracious, kind human I am. Give me half your money. Yep. Mm. And Mm. because the Irish, because there were so many of them at this time, at at this point, they were a very powerful uh, voting bloc, particularly in New York City. Yeah. And and I mean, and and to be fair, the Irish were demonized when they first came to these shores, which is so ironic to me, because, again, this is where white on white crime, because I'm like, Irish people, yeah. when you think of white people, you definitely think of Irish people. OK, listen, they're translucent. Like, it's I fine. Mean, they're beautiful. But like, that's yeah. white. That's a white person. But What's it's your always problem? that it's that English Irish on crime. Uh-huh. It's the uh, the classism, the English looking down, the English and the Dutch looking mm-hmm. down on the Irish and the Irish. Yeah. A lot of the immigrants uh, that were flooding the city at the times because of the uh, the potato the famine. famine, which was yeah. caused by the English. Mm, that's um, a whole nother mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That's true. And so they were looked down upon. And so when you're desperate, you have nothing. You the people who are kind to you, the people who's the people who are waiting at the docks to say, "Hey, do you need a place to stay?" Yep, hey, you're gonna vote go for them here. Every time you're gonna yeah. vote for them every fucking time, and I can't yep. blame them. So yeah, I I can't I blame them at all. And by this time, um, the numbers had reached so that they really held a lot of political power. The Irish and the Irish American um, voting bloc in New York City. So they basically. Um, William had so much power uh, at this time that he became known as Boss Tweed. Yes. Uh, and eventually he appointed himself Deputy Street Commissioner. And I'm again- going to appoint myself Deputy Street Commissioner, too. <laughs> that sounds good. I'm Deputy yeah. Street Commissioner. And basically he he just, it, which is so interesting because like on paper, you're like, but he took a step down politically, but it's like, no, he got more power. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminds yeah. me of a, do you remember Blagojevich? Remember that guy in in Chicago? Oh my God. Yes. He basically was back. trying to sell uh, the yeah. Senate seat that was uh, vacated by Obama when he became president. I so he basically this. was like on the phone, like whoever's going to pay me the most, I'm going to get the most about this. Like, for this mm-hmm. thing, like, even though mm-hmm. it's like, no, dude, you're supposed to just appoint somebody and like, and then next yeah. two years, people vote for that position again. No, it's the same thing. And so he would like, once he did that, he put his, his friends into, you know, key roles. He opened up a law office, oh my even God. though he wasn't a lawyer uh, and began receiving large payments from corporations for his legal services. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to open my law office tomorrow. Yeah. You're welcome to pay me money for my legal services. Yeah. So he he just reaped some, and it wasn't just him. They reaped so much money, so much money that he had to find a way to launder it. Like, so I'm thinking back to last week's episode of Sister Ping, right? Right. So like, there's so much money, you have to find a way to launder it. Um, I also always, whenever I think of money laundering, I always have that image in my head. Do you remember Bad Boys? I think it's Bad Boys 2. I never saw it. Uh, oh, it's so good. It's better than one. One is okay, okay. but Bad Boys 2 is, is much better. And I remember like the drug dealer, baddie guy, whatever. Um, he had so much money that the rat, he was hiding the cash in his house that the rats were starting to eat the money. Oh my God. Oh, so he had to figure disgusting. out a way to, to launder it. Like, yeah. But yeah, and I was just like, that, that is a lot of money. So, um, now at the same time, again, so this is like, so now we're in 1860 when he appoints himself, um, deputy commissioner, right? So let's say Mary's had her, she's on her eighth child. <laughs> I mean, she's been so Damn. busy and by yeah. all accounts, he had mistresses the whole time. I think it's one of those wow. things where, 
uh, which a lot of marriages, I think back then was like, you marry them and then you realize, oh, that's not the man I wanted to marry, but she, but, but their status in society has also risen. Yeah. They live in I a mean, big fancy house. Uh, because I'm sure, again, I mean, I'm sure she has nannies at the wazoo, you know, wazoo, uh, but also she's getting invited to i've seen the gilded age she's getting invited mm-hmm. to women's organizations oh, yes she's up there Mrs. she has a Tweed. fancy carriage Welcome. you know yeah. um you know even though people und- and then i would i would imagine that the women folk were not looped into a lot of this they, you know yeah so i mean i, mean, I cannot i cannot see the world in which he would come home every night and share with her all of his trials and tribulations. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And the thing about him, and I say women folk, uh, like, sarcastically, but like, and also, he, so he had so much power locally that in 1867, so they've already have 10 children by now and massively, right. obscenely rich, he got himself elected to the state Senate and started doing the same thing at the state level. Oh, shit. Okay. So basically he just, it was just corruption upon corruption upon corruption. And you could never vote them out because they had so much power yeah. with this base. And again, the base is happy because they don't really realize that instead of a $10 job, they could actually be making a $20, $25 hour job. Right. And not they don't really pay understand. into. Yeah. Right. So basically Tammany Hall's power became unchecked and unchallenged. Now, it's estimated that the losses to New York City from this corruption from the time that he was in control was about two hundred million dollars in the eighteen sixties. Whoa. Which That's would like be about five six trillion dollars. Six okay. billion dollars. About six billion dollars in today's money. Oh my and his God. personal take, which he was later convicted as, because this all started con- unraveling was his personal take was between 25 and 45 million which is uh 250 million to a billion dollars okay that's insanity so he yeah. reigned supreme for about 20 something years but in the 1870s his luck started to change and this is so interesting because of you know how we talk about people getting canceling canceled yeah, and yeah, da, da, yeah. Da. it's like so the old version of this <laughs> Okay. Was basically cartoons in the newspaper. <laughs> no, that's what I imagine. That's like been in my head this entire conversation. Are those political cartoons. satire? That, yeah, yep. that's how I know about Boss Tweed. He was taken down by a man, by an immigrant, actually. I believe he's of German descent, uh, by a man by the name of Thomas Nast, who was a political satirist for, the Har- for Harper's Weekly. Okay. So he started. Right. Because, uh, again, a lot of the people were illiterate because when people are illiterate, it's also easy to control them as well. Uh, right? Oh, yes. Very much so. <laughs> That's why they want to close libraries in actual schools. That's why yeah. they don't want kids to learn certain things. Because yeah. when people are you- dumb, not dumb, when people are illiterate or uh, not uh, like in the know of what's going on, it's ignorant. easy to control them. Yeah, so. exactly. So Nass began to run these uh, these political satire cartoons that, and you have to look these up. These are a thing of beauty, actually. Um, he started running these in July of 1871, and basically he would write, he would draw uh, Tweed, who was a, a large man. He was over six feet tall, which was especially uh, tall for back then, but as like a like a really fat yes obese man who is fat on greed yeah um and because people because people read the papers every day because they didn't have uh yeah. anything else to do really and people who weren't literate could understand it just by looking at the picture yep <laughs> and it would show him there it, it these are a thing of beauty you have to look these up it would show him be, being like gorged on uh, the money that he's stolen from New York. He and his cronies. Yeah. And he started yeah. adding, Nass started adding some of the other ringleaders as well uh, after a while, but he really focused on Tweed. Some people think it was like, even though Tweed was considered Irish because of his affiliation with the Irish voting bloc, he was actually Scottish. Oh, oh. Uh, Scottish uh, descent, but they, so they, they, uh, 
So it kind of like fed into the anti-Irish sentiment as well. And like just greedy and like oh. it's, when you see it, he just looks large, like huge. Like it's like disgusting. I don't want an anti-Irish sentiment, but I also don't want him to continue to steal and control and be hurtful. So, you know. Yeah. And I, I'm wondering what is Mary doing at this time? Right. That's what so I'm wondering too. Like what like does she feel? There's not a lot of public stuff going on. Um, I'm sure her family, you know, they have it within their family um, history, like what was going on, but there's no public. You rarely saw her in public. Oh, interesting. Um, she obviously for a woman of her station with this kind of money, she joined various women's organizations, but Right. She was very, she was very rarely seen in public. Unlike him, he was also had a very boisterous personality. He was loud. And some people say that his detriment was that he was so ostentatious. So he bought, yeah. a, like, I said, like I said, like the man said, it's not enough for him to have a big house. He almost has to have the biggest house on the block. It's right. not enough for him to have, he started wearing a gold uh, medallion as a pennant on his, as a tie pen, yeah, like just very right. ostentatious. Uh, what you think of like uh, just a greedy, corrupt uh, and fat person, basically. So it's an anti-fatness, fat phobia, but they weren't war wrong because he was robbing the city and then the yeah. state blind. Um, I mean, so sometimes to call attention to like a very big problematic person, I'm a, like a little bit like, you know what? He's stolen essentially billions of dollars from all of these people. Yeah, because that are even like, though... Hugh, I think you may, and because they tried to, the newspaper tried to run these stories, but he has a lot of control of places, right? Yeah, yeah. So how do you get it through? They're like, oh, and they didn't realize the power of the political sat satirist yeah. cartoon until Nast weaponized it for good. Yeah. Now, Nast. so because these these uh, cartoons became immensely popular, people would wait for them, and because of that people started turning their eye because also the powers that be oh. on the on the other side were always trying to get tweed and his cronies but they could never stick anything anything to them because they would pay people off uh they can never get them not promoted i mean not uh reelected because of the voting block so it's like how can you get them and they had tried for years and years and years but they couldn't really get any support in the right places but yeah. the tide had turned because of these cartoons so Basically, it was open season and people, people, even people who had gone along with it were kind of tired of being like bled dry from these bribes. Well, I mean, I'm sure that like as time goes by, there's um, there are other people who have other jobs, who have other situations that are not as you know, like you can learn yeah. like, wait, I can get out of this. I don't I you know, like at some point life changes, the opportunities yeah. change. So they started going after him and he was arrested, but he, you know, he was indicted, then he was acquitted, then he was retried. Eventually he was convicted on over 200 counts of fraud, forgery, voter suppression, and the list goes on and on and sentenced to jail in 1873. Oh. Can we pause for just like a quick second? Because mm -hmm. that feels very modern day, doesn't yep. it? Uh, yeah. Mm. D did you see the mugshot? Hmm. Oh, Christmas mm -hmm. came early today. Christmas in August, girl. Christmas in August. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, I did a little bit of a happy dance. Hopefully something yep. comes of it, but you I know. am very happy with a mugshot. So listen, let's take our wins. Let's take our wins and celebrate them. I will take okay. it. I will take yes. it because we didn't think we would get that ever. No, so. we didn't. Mm. So Mary's husband Again, she is now when this breaks off, she actually goes to Paris to get oh. out of out of town. Uh, she's probably like, motherfucker, you've already been embarrassing me with these harlots. <laughs> right. OK. You I'm know, going to Paris. I'm and gonna drink now, wine. Okay. Because I would imagine that she's in with these upscale, classy women. Right. Yeah. And then this is just because back then. You blame shame on uh, the whole family, right? Especially right. when they're well connected and wealthy. So she actually goes to um, to Paris in 1871. So when this, like, when the heat starts oh, okay. to go on, so she goes to Paris, 
And um, again, he's convicted. He's all alone. So he he was he was ordered to pay back certain money to make a long story short. He actually yeah. got he actually escaped. What? Are you in serious? 18, in 1875 from prison. He probably paid some money off. Yeah, he paid he a lot left, of people. Went yeah. to Spain. Oh my God. And then <laughs> was brought back, extradited back to New York. So Spain and, was like, no, not our problem. Mm-mm. Mary Mm-mm. the whole time, Mary Jane the whole time is in Paris. She and apparently some reports say that only his one of his daughters visited him while he was in prison. By all accounts, he was uh, penniless when he was in prison. So he lost all his money. Wow! It, it could be that they seized it because they realized it was, yeah. you know. And again, I'm wondering, again, what happened to Jane? Did she? Yeah. Did she abscond to Paris with a lot of cash? Yeah. I mean, I want to say that she did. And here's why I think she did. Why? Unless someone actually knows. Because she was raised by not only people who educated her, but people who taught her that she deserves a certain level of life, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I know her brain just went, yeah, no, these are mine. I had to be married to that for 20 years. I earned this shit. And she took it. You know what? Like, I'm not even mad about it. Like, you did. You had to be married to that. And that must have been awful, honestly. I just think it's also an interesting uh, question of complicity, right? Like, like, oh yeah, how much of what too. she knew? Like, you I know, have I'm a sure feeling she, she knew. She probably she probably knew and chose chose not to know. Like, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I. I she probably knew to some degree because the level of wealth and power that 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 they had was unprecedented. Yeah. And you know what? To keep in mind, he owned two steam powered yachts, <laughs> a fifth Avenue Rock. mansion, fifth yeah. Avenue, only like Rockefellers and stuff had mansions on fifth Avenue. Yeah. They had an estate in Connecticut. Um, he had so much money and she was the queen of this, even though, again, because yes. I'm sure women put up with a lot of talent, you know, like your husband sure. running out, it's almost expected, right? Um, but this is scandal when you realize, well, your your wealth is built on the backs of the working poor and the people in New York City. Yeah. I don't think she was innocent. I just yeah. don't. There's, it's hard. Yeah. Maybe she didn't realize the level but she kind of knew, like you don't get that kind of money. By yeah, I mean, especially up up, you know? especially being a well, being a politician, because it's not like he was a man of industry, right? So it's not like he was an oil or right or or I don't know. I mean, she grew up around uh, business. Obviously, um, it sounds like her family had money, but not like this kind of money. So, Nobody has that kind of money. Yeah, They're unless you're Rockefeller. Yeah, and, like yeah. So he now. Uh, he eventually died in prison in lower Manhattan on April 12th, Aww. 1878. That's satisfying. Um, Go on. Yeah. He was buried in uh, the family plot in Brooklyn, reportedly worth only $2,500. Ah! <laughs> so I'm cackling. I don't know what now, happened. <laughs> like I said, he now I, but then I wonder if, because all reports were saying after he died, people said that she wouldn't be long after. So maybe they still, I'm just fascinated by this relationship really? okay. because people said that she probably would follow him soon after. And she did. She reportedly died in Paris in, on February 13th, 1880 at the age of 54. What? How? So just two years after him from heartbreak, from humiliation. I'm like just so fascinated and Girl, so frustrated take your also. Girl, money and start a business. But yeah, you know what? Maybe like she like loved him, you know? I, I mean, mean, I think there's something to that. Like, and I found a report, um, I found an announcement rather from February 14th, 1880 in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle paper that read, quote, Mrs. Tweed, the wife of the late William M. Tweed, died in Paris yesterday. She has resided abroad for some time and has been in feeble health. When her husband died, it was thought she could not live long. 
Her family consisted of eight children, four sons, and four daughters. One of the latter has been an invalid from childhood. Two of the married daughters live in New Orleans and one in New York. News of her death was received by her daughter, Mrs. Douglas, in New York, end quote. So, I mean, again, the Gilded Age is it's, is about 1877 to 1900. So this is happening at the height of that, of like, you know, yeah. being invited to the right parties, you know, rep, family, rep, family reputation being everything that it is. Um, and then later on, she her, so her her body was brought back to the States. And okay. I found in that same paper, I actually found an announcement um, on March 9th. So a few weeks later that read, quote, the body of Mrs. William M. Tweed, who recently died in Paris, arrived at New York yesterday on the steamship. So. Uh, Silesia. It was taken to the house of her daughter, Mrs. Douglas, at 63 East 77th Street. The funeral services tomorrow will be private and the remains will be interred in Greenwood beside those of Mr. Tweed, end quote. I mean, okay. Listen. So. I, you know, I also, why do they have, why does she have eight children when she had 10 children earlier? And it could be that they they died. It it could have been like, and again, some of these announcements, you have to take them with a grain of salt. Like some, I think only the children, only the actual family members know for sure. Even though, again, not much is known for, uh, for her, but I'm just fascinated by her, like women like her, uh, Bernie Madoff's, uh, wife. I was thinking of her. You know, uh, like the scandal, like, and also the nature of their relationships. Like, how That's, much do you know? I feel yeah. like women know. I feel like wives know their husbands. I can I only mean, speak to straight, cis, you know, cis, right. gender, like heterosexual relationships. I feel like women usually know their husbands, especially if they've had 10 plus children, Ten eight plus, plus children together. Children. And been together I mean, since you were 20 or 18. You know, you know, there's probably something to be said for willful ignorance. Mm-hmm. And, and as a woman, you're just not going to get in trouble for it because you're just a woman. So she probably knew that. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just a girl in the I mean, world. Like, I wonder, is there, is there like a fictional version of this where she's like, they're like political partners? See, that's what I'm saying. Like, and I would, I would watch that movie. I would watch that movie all day. And she's just like, and every time she's in public, she's like, oh, hey, I can't giggle, you know, tee But then it's yeah. like, okay, here's where your next move is. You got to shake this group up. You know, rough or them up. She she could be the long suffering wife. It reminds me of those women who are very religious, and then they marry like the most like yes. dastardly roguish men yeah, who run it. around on them, and they stay <laughs> married forever. And you're just yep. like, why yeah. haven't you killed him? I don't understand. I don't understand. Yeah, like I don't know, but that is Mary Jane Skaden Tweed. Mary Jane Tweed, like she is amazing. I'm I am fascinated by her. I am too. Like, yeah. I just thought, even though, and again, I apologize that, that we don't have more information about her, but I think we should be aware because again, if you're ever out there, like, and women, she had a whole life. She had a whole life separate yeah. from him with her children. But I'm just fascinated that someone so high profile and right. so wealthy we, that there's nothing. so little information on her. Like, what did she do in Paris, girl? What did you do? Were you like buying beautiful dresses? Were you designing something? I don't know. Like, I, I just want to know. Very fascinating. Yeah, me too. Um, okay. Thank you so, for that. Yeah, my pleasure. Who's your notorious woman this week? Who do you have for me? So my notorious woman, ever so often, I like to bring someone. I just like to bring attention to women who existed and thrived in a way that I feel like our society doesn't recognize. Okay. So this woman, I'm just going to talk about her kind of, to me, to, this is to me an amazing life. Um, okay. She's Chinese. So I'm going to try not to offend a whole nation. Um, 
by my but by, by my what I'm about to say. Her name is Wang Zhenyi. Okay. Uh, she Wang? was born Wang Zhenyi. Okay. Uh, she was born in the Anhui province in 1768. Um, but her grandfather's family moved to present day Nanjing pretty okay. much immediately. Um, when she was a kid, she was very fond of reading and she was very, very smart. She was raised by her grandfather, her grandmother, and her father. No idea what happened to her mother. Probably died um, in childbirth. Right? Probably died in childbirth is like probably your best bet here. Yeah. Um, because the family seemed very close and very connected. So uh, her grandfather, also, uh, Wang, Wang Jefu, I'm so sorry, uh, was a former governor of Fengcheng County and was really, really smart and had a deep love of reading. He had a collection of over 75 book shelves, not 75 wow. books, book shelves. Um, so her father had failed the imperial examination. Do you, uh -oh. do you, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's do you know what a big that, deal. Yeah. Is, I, I mean, it's one of those things where I've heard a lot about it. Like I haven't heard a lot about it, but I've heard a little bit about it. It's for you to, if you don't know, it's like, um, it was the one thing that was like, hey, anyone could be um, part of the state bureaucracy. Like, yeah, yeah. It's not just like ordained by God or however, you know, like it, it's your intelligence, but they have this ridiculously hard test that was like yeah. three days long. And you could, I think you could only take it three times. And if you failed the third time, I'm, I might be making Oh, that really? Up. I didn't know that. I know that I briefly, I've, if I'm remembering my undergrad, like, Chinese history classes like basically it was like a scholar um court like so they yeah. would use these tests to place you within the court of bur bureaucracy which uh like basically um guaranteed that you'd have a job and be able to take right. care of your family and, so, and yeah. you'd be a you'd you'd basically live the life of a noble person without having been born into nobility exactly so yeah. you know it's better than not having this option I think um, yeah. but he, he did not pass, but instead that's the thing with his test. Like he clearly was very, very smart. Uh, he studied medical science and recorded his findings in a four volume collection called Yifang Yang Chao, which was a collection of medical prescriptions. So oh. her grandfather was her first teacher in astronomy and her grandmother was her teacher of poetry. Um, her all, her father also taught her medicine, geography, and mathematics. So she was born in a family that absolutely understood she should have all the education. Yeah, that's great. Um, <clears throat> her grandfather died in 1782. So she was like 14, 15. And they traveled to Jiling, which was close to the Great Wall, for his funeral. And they stayed in that region for five years. Um, oh, my guess is travel back then. Like yeah. you, you don't just like fly there and then come on back. You just like, you got the journey. The journey was done and you're done. Right. Yeah. For at least five years. That sounds That's, terrible. But five years. Wow. Wow. That's a long time. That's um, college, right? College. That is, and, which and is then funny. one year of grad school. So. Right. <laughs> um, and that is where she gained a lot of knowledge, a lot of her knowledge. She read a lot of her grandfather's books um, and she learned equestrian skills, archery and martial arts from the wife of a Mongolian general named Ah, A. -A. Oh, okay. okay. Right. At 16, she traveled south, south of the Yangtze river with her father uh, until she moved back to the capital. So while she did that, she was able to travel to a lot of different places throughout China, which definitely broadened her horizons. Um, when she was 18, she made friends with female scholars in Jiangning, which uh, I guess is where they right. settled. I think, you know, this is a long time ago about a woman in yeah. China. So <sighs> yeah. please, please humor this. Um, and so through her knowledge, through her poetry, so she met these scholars through her poetry. So just pointing out, there are a lot of other female scholars 
who wrote poetry and did things at this time. And then she began to focus her studies in astronomy and mathematics. And most of her studies were self-taught. Oh, wow. Right? I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out in a classroom with, you know, adjudicated professors. She's well, teaching she, herself. She sounds gifted, actually. Yeah, so. really gifted. Yeah. Um, she got married when she was 25 to a man named Jean May. Oh, and so old. I know, right? That's what I was thinking, too. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ancient woman. Um, so after her marriage, she actually became better known for her poetry and knowledge in math and astronomy. Um, that she started to teach male students. Oh. Yeah. So in astronomy and mathematics, where she very much excelled, one of her contributions was being able to describe her views of celestial phenomena in her article, quote, dispute the procession of the equinoxes. So she was able to explain and prove how equinoxes moved and then how to calculate their movements. Oh, wow. She, yeah, right? She also wrote other articles uh, such as, uh, quote, dispute of longitude and stars, as well as, quote, the explanation of a lunar eclipse. What? Okay. I, you said words, but I don't. You know, there's reading and then there's reading comprehension. Uh, yes. So, yes. yeah. Honestly, like what I just read out loud to you and to everyone was not reading comprehension. That was just <laughs> reading. Okay. Eclipse sounds familiar. I know that. Star. Okay. Stars, right? Yeah. That's a word. That's like yeah. Hollywood, right? No? Yep. Okay. Working on it. <laughs> um, so she would comment on the number of stars, the evolving direction of the sun, the moon, and the planets. Um, she described the relationship between lunar and solar eclipses. Uh, what? They're different? I don't know. Um, she <laughs> studied the research of other astronomers, but she also was able to do her own original research. Okay. So one of her experiments, this is what she did. And I read this like five times so that I could try to understand it to explain it. She placed a round table in a garden pavilion, which acted as a globe. So then she hung a crystal lamp on a cord from the ceiling beams and that represented the sun. Then on one side of the table, she had a round mirror like the moon. She moved these three objects as if they were the sun, the earth, and the moon, according to astronomical principles. Her findings and observations were very accurate and recorded in her article, quote, the explanation of the solar eclipse, end quote. Oh. Right? You know, Let's you go. know, there's some like science person out there is like, yeah, that's simple, guys. That's elementary. And we're like, oh, that sounds <laughs> I know, you know, all very our complicated. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> all our science people are like, I don't know that she's a genius. And we're like, she is a genius. But I still think she's a genius. Well, also because it's in the ancient world, right? Right. Like, right. Or 1700s, like, what is considered ancient? I think, I don't know. I guess that wouldn't be ancient. That wouldn't no, be ancient. ancient would be pre. In the pre, Western world, like, we do pre-Christ. We basically do pre-Christ and post-Christ. Yeah. So, but like, seventeen hundreds though, like you just you didn't you couldn't Google anything in seventeen hundreds. No, you which know? I will add. Side note, uh -huh. yeah, they knew even then that the Earth is not flat. You dumb motherfuckers who think the <laughs> Earth is flat. Okay, I'm yeah. Just Go ahead. Darling. So she's definitely much smarter than a lot of people she's in the world right much now. Much smarter than let's say twenty percent of the current population on Earth. Okay, is it twenty percent? Yeah, it is. That's a lot of people. Okay, girl. Mm. girl. Mm -hmm. Um. So let's talk about her math nerdery because it is it it, it excels. Here we go. So she mastered trigonometry and knew the Pythagorean. Pythagorean theorem. Listen, I never even took trigonometry. I'm going to I'm going to call myself out. Okay? Cuz I didn't have to. She mastered it like by herself. Cool. Yeah, that this this woman is obviously gifted. I mean, I took I did take trig 
in uh, high school I, and calculus. You are smarter than me. Yeah, um, no, I know. I can't remember <laughs> much of it uh, because I am uh, dumb most of the time. So the fact that she self-taught in the 1700s, again, she is clearly gifted. So Yeah, she wrote an article called, ready, The Explanation of the Pythagorean Theorem and Trigonometry. Okay. And she described like a triangle and the relationship between the shorter leg of the triangle, the long mm. leg and the triangles hypotenuse, like very correctly. She was correct. And when I read that sentence just now, like I got a little PTSD from <laughs> all of the math classes I had to take back when I was young. Okay. I was like, what? I don't know what side. Leave me alone. You were so um, funny. So she she was a big fan of the mathematician Mei Wending, who was he was famous in the early Qing dynasty, and he wrote the book Principles of Calculation. So she became a master of this book and rewrote it with simpler language and made it available to others under the title The Musts of Calculation. Now, see, this is what makes her brilliant, because it's yes. one thing to understand something but the ability to then explain it to mm -hmm. dumber people <laughs> <laughs> and understand how that's necessary, how you're yes. going to make the world a better place if more people understand these things. Yes. Yes. Like that is the real gift. Actually, yeah. I think um, she simplified multiplication and division. Uh, she was dedicated in her study of math and wrote a book called The Simple Principles of Calculation when she was 24. Uh, wow. She said, this is a quote from her, that her studies were difficult, but she said, quote, there were times I had to put, I'm going to re-say that because there was a that. I'm going to start again. Here we go. Quote, okay. there were times that I had to put down my pen and sigh, but I love the subject. I do not give up. Yes, wow. girl. I don't even think she recognized how how out of the box she was living. Well, I think people who are gifted don't because it's yeah. obvious to their brain. Yeah, exactly. You know, but it's not to the rest of us. We just don't see. It's kind of like those things. I think uh, when you see, I saw one on Twitter recently, I'm not calling it the other thing. Um, and it's like <laughs> a picture and it had yeah. like numbers in it, but it also looked like faces. Oh yeah. And like, I was like, oh, I did good. I found seven. And it's like, oh, actually, there's like 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those people like, see the 12 of them. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Like, those are right the people there. who see the yeah. 12 immediately yeah. and not have to be told there's 12. And then you're like, oh, I see the 12 now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'm married to a man who sees the 12. So oh, just I love so it. Know. I, I yeah. think I think it's great because it's like they have like a yeah they literally see things that other people don't yeah. which I think is it should be celebrated so every so often he's like you're smart too honey and I'm like stop just stop yeah and different you know. things I mean people <laughs> learn differently but yeah, yeah math and science it and like I said I took trade and calculus and but again I'm not like and I knew oh, then shut up you are no I knew then I was like yeah because when I was really really little I wanted to be an astronaut but oh. nah, I'm not smart enough to be to do astronaut math. No, no. I mean, get a tutor, figure it out, you know. Uh, no. No. Astro <laughs> astronaut math is a whole nother yeah. ball game. So, That's, yeah. I just, I went, oh, no, I don't want to leave the earth. That sounds terrible. That's my, that was my take on being an astronaut. Oh, no. I'm um, telling you first, when I can, when I get my coins together, I'm going to space. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let me I'm know how it is. totally going to space. Okay. Take pictures for me. Oh, yeah. Oh, that'd yeah. be so great. Oh, I'm not. Yes. I'll just buy like another house or something. I don't <laughs> care if they, if I go to space, I don't want to die in space. But if I die up there, I'd be fine with it because I will be dust to dust, ashes to ashes. It's all going okay. back to the universe. All right. Listen. All right. <laughs> I mean, but to be able to see the earth from space, come on. I don't want to do that. That's going to freak me out. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Nope. I would die. Be no, so great. You. So great. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I'm not even done because she also wrote poetry. Of course like, she did. Lots of it. Um, 
Wait a minute. So she yeah. she's smarty pants with math and science and she's creative. And like, what are you doing? Like I was creative. So it was like, okay, that math and science weren't my thing. But now she can do everything. Come on. So if this woman has more than one tooth in her mouth, I hate her. Because that means she's yeah. wonderful and perfect in every I'm, way. I've, okay. I've seen pictures of her. She like drawings. Yeah. She's got more she than one tooth. Least... Tooth and not yeah. tooth. Tooth yeah, with no, an F. She's got, tooth. She's got okay. so got many toofs. I can't Toofs. Even. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, gosh. She, she left, okay, 13 volumes of, <gasps> it's called C, C-I, which is lyric poetry in the tradition of classical Chinese poetry that also draws upon folk traditions. She wrote po- prose and prefaces and postscripts written for other works. Um, the famous King Dynasty scholar Yuan Mei commented on her poetry by saying, it had the flavor of a great pen, not of a female poet, end quote. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Not only is she good, she's good like like a person, not like a woman, but like a person. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um, and her because po- her poetry was known for its lack of flowery words, which was mm-hmm. considered common to feminine traits. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know what just came out of my mouth. I think it was my normal feminine reaction to things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so her poetry included her understanding of classics and history and experiences during her travels, such as sceneries and the lives of commoners with whom she made acquaintances. So she also depicted the hard lives of commoners, especially those of laboring women in poems like, quote, women breeder of silkworm, end quote, and, quote, clothes washing. Mm. She also portrayed corruption. It's our theme today. Yeah. And the polar contrast between the lives of the rich and poor in poems like, quote, a poem of eight lines. And I'm going to read that poem. Okay. So... Hold on. Here we go. It's short. Don't worry. Village is empty of cooking smoke. Rich families let grains store decay. In wormwood strewed pitiful starved bodies, greedy officials yet push farm levying. Mm -hmm. Damn, girl has a point. Wow. Girl has a point. So she, no idea why. She died when she was 29 years old. Oh, no. I know. And they, they don't know how she died. Um, I did not expect that. But she did know she was dying. Oh. So, it, so when she was dying, she gave her works and her manuscripts to her best friend, Madame Kwai. Um, and then he, he, she eventually passed them on to her nephew, um, Kian Yiji, who was a famous scholar at the time. Um, and he compiled her work into, um, what she called simple, what he called simple principles of calculation. And he describes her as the quote, number one female scholar after Ban Zhao. So Ban Zhao is also an interesting human we should look into. Yeah. Um, in Aww. one of her poems, I'm going to read one more poem, which I okay. I was like, okay, notorious woman got to love. Here we go. Okay. It's made to believe women are the same as men. Are you not convinced daughters can also be heroic? Yes. Yes. Yes, they can. Yep. Um, and that, so she also, I, it said in my research that she, in, she had a good marriage. Um, she did not like social feudal values um quote her when talking about learning and sciences people thought of no woman uh Mm. she said quote women should only do cooking and sewing and that they should not be bothered about writing articles for publication studying history composing poetry or doing calligraphy men and women quote are all people who have the same reason for studying like like, let's call this woman out. Let's talk about how she was in the 1700s, okay? And yeah. died at 29 and did all of this. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
1994, the Inter- International Astronomical Union, uh, Union's Working Group for Planetary System Nomenclature, they named the planets. That's an easier oh, okay. version gotcha. of that. Gotcha. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, they named a crater on Venus, Wang Zhenyi, after her. Oh. I mean, just a crater, but that's fine. I'll take it. Yeah. I mean, no one's, there's no Levitic crater. Like, yeah, I don't think a Miriam crater is coming anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I feel like Miriam's the kind of I, name that's on stuff. Like, I hear you, but I don't think I'm going to be the inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> You can take credit for that. I'm that mirror. Thank you. That, that, I'm that mirror. Uh, that's yeah. me. That's yeah. me. I'm the great scientist. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, uh-huh. right. Wow. And they still don't know what she died of. Nope. No idea. I, I mean, I don't think they can ever really know. Wow. But she knew she was dying. Probably some disease that was happening at the time. Yeah. Some sort of, you know. Yeah. Wow. I did not I mean, expect that at all. People died of paper wow. cuts back then. So I mean, they did. And, you know, it's just, oh, wow. But she left a, a, a very rich legacy. Yeah. Like, for such a short. Do you ever think about the legacy her? you would have left at 29? Mm. No, um, let's not think about that. You know what? I, I actually had this conversation once where I was visiting a, um, a, funer- uh, a funeral place, a burial ground. And I was like, you know. Because I look at all the the inscriptions and people are like beloved wife, beloved mother, beloved right. daughter, da da da. And I was like, who's gonna? I hope someone says that she was a kind person. Yeah. You know, who liked yeah. who liked like a- murderess? Uh, who stab stab stab? But deep down, <laughs> she's a softy. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna have that on my stab, my tombstone. Stab stab but also a softy. Yep. <laughs> Yep. That is you. I mean, when I that think is about me. you. That is totally me. <laughs> but, but at like 29, like you, um, you might not have the clarity to, um, you know, no, because you don't, you think you have plenty more life. 29. Wow. wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. So, uh, wow. So can you say her name one last time for me? I can, but I'm going to look at it. So I'm going to okay. make sure I'm looking at it correctly. Okay. And I'm doing that now. Here we go. Wang Zhenyi. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Wow. 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 Um, And then she's one of like two prominent uh, female women scientists during that time. Which Like I I almost switched, but I was like, no, I got to go with my girl right now. But yeah, I wish it were more women. So many women that we couldn't name them, but right know, at that time so but wow I mean, well thank you so much for sharing we got uh, her that and that's the thing that's Jimmy. sort of the point there's um, so much more out there than like we're given you yeah. know yep particularly around stories around women uh, right. or femmes uh and so it's you know that is what we're doing here and also we want to make you laugh people uh right, like hopefully Hopefully you're learning a little something and and getting a little chuckle every episode. And um, again, thank you for joining us every week. We really, really appreciate it. That's going to wrap up this latest episode of Notorious Women podcast. Guys, remember to follow us on what? All the things. All the things. All the things. Yep. Um, you, Miriam's going to tell you in a little bit how you can find us on IG. But go to the Apple Store and give us a five-star review. You can do that. Five pretty stars. please. Pretty please. Please, please. With a cherry on top. Just like click the five. Click the Just five. Like, I mean, yeah. it'd be nice if you can be like, they are so pretty and smart mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and Clever. the most beautifulest women in the world. And you the, can say that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Or uh-huh. just five stars. I get yeah. it. You don't have time. Lots going I on. I hear you. I get it. Um, <laughs> but you could also support us in other ways on patreon.com if you want to give us some little cash, some moolah, um, some honey, some cheese, you know, some cheddar. Uh, you can do that mm-hmm. at patreon.com slash notorious women. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash notorious women. Patreon.com slash notorious women. And Miriam is going to tell you another ways you can find us and help so us you out. Can- you can also follow us on Instagram, which is a fun, good time. 
Um, it's a. I like. I, I curate it as best I can. I try to find the good things, um, and that is so easy. It's Notorious Women Podcast on Instagram. Also, FYI, we just started the TikTok situation. Oh yeah, that's right. That's yeah. all. Yeah, and yeah. it's all me. <laughs> I'm it is. Take it that is. Credit. Uh, so come like like our things that we we're putting some videos of like our faces on it. So yeah, the tickety tock. Uh, <laughs> that'd be great. TikTok, um, yes. TikTok, TikTok. Uh, we might have to do a dance or something. Uh, yes, something. you know, yes. like I really want to do a lot of dances. So yeah, yeah, I can do that. Or they'd be like, look at those old ladies trying to be young. Listen, uh, they're just jealous of us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what's it. happening. Yeah, that, may, that, that tracks, right? All right um, that wraps wait, it up. We will Wait, oh, wait, on. wait. You can oh, also I'm sorry. Gmail, notoriouswmpod at gmail.com. If you have thoughts right. or ideas, send them your way. You can also DM us too. If that. And right. hey, you can always give us ideas about dances that we can do. Too. Yes, we need yeah. them, actually. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know about you. I don't know what you're talking about. I can dance, girl. Sorry, I can dance. Bad. Okay. Sometimes okay. badly. Sometimes like a, a baby Listen. that's uh, having spasms. But, you know. Adorable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. On that note, we will see you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining us as always. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye.